Okay. Hi, my name is Lisa Grasty, and I'm the legal director at Disability Rights North Carolina. Um, I have been practicing law for about 25 years, mostly in the area of employment law, and the last uh, nine or so in the area specifically of disability issues, including employment law. Um, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about the ADA today once we get started. And I'm Allison Bartlett. I am the manager of disability programs with the Huntington's Disease Society of America. I've been practicing law for five years now, specializing in disability law and primarily assisting families with Huntington's disease, which is why I now give these presentations, because I know the ins and outs of social security disability law as it pertains to dis or Huntington's disease. Great. <clears throat> well, I guess we'll just get started with the ADA uh, portion of the, of the presentation, although um, we may intersperse our discussions a little bit, um, and I hope that uh, Allison can supply some questions since we don't have a live audience, and I'll try to do the same um, as topics come up. I want to give a little bit of background first um, about the ADA more generally. Most folks are somewhat familiar with the Americans with Disabilities Act. It was passed in 1990, um, and it's one of a series of disability um, uh, laws uh, that include the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 and, and also encompasses some other um, state and federal laws. But we talk about the ADA generally because most people are familiar with it. It's the most comprehensive of the, the disability rights laws um, and it kind of covers the, basis, uh, the basics of what uh, most folks need to understand about disability um, rights law. So the Americans with Disabilities Act, as I said, was passed in 1990. Um, it was uh, expressly passed by Congress as a broad and comprehensive mandate uh, for the inclusion of people with disabilities in society. Um, the purpose really of the ADA broadly is to remove barriers for folks with disabilities. And the idea really behind the ADA and similar laws is that um, sort of structurally and programmatically society was sort of built not with people with disabilities in mind necessarily. So a lot of the physical structures that we have in our society, a lot of the ways in which we organize our, our social and, and uh, work lives and, and um, all the aspects of uh, our interactions with other people was not really initially built with people with disabilities in mind. And so these, this creates barriers, of course, for folks, physical barriers and other barriers to participating fully in, um, in life in America. Uh, and so the ADA was passed with that in mind, and it, is, uh, it was developed into three primary titles. There are some sort of uh, other titles that are more technical, but the primary titles of the ADA are the first uh, title, Title I, which covers employment, which we'll talk about in more detail. Um, the, uh, the second title of the ADA, Title II, uh, covers uh, public entities, so any governmental entity at the um, state or local level um, agencies and so on. Uh, it covers the activities of public entities. Um, and then Title III covers what are called public accommodations, which sounds the same thing, like the same thing, but a public accommodation is really any business uh, that is not a, not a government entity, but that's open to the public. So stores, um, movies, hotels, offices, places that anybody might go. Um, so some examples of um, public entity uh, access, so Title II, public entities, government, um, that are pertinent to folks with uh, disabilities. Um, if you watch any of the many updates that we get um, on a daily basis from governors and um, local officials, you'll see that there's usually somebody there engaging in sign language and, and essentially um, translating what the, the speaker is saying. That is obviously for folks who are deaf and that is that public entity providing access to the same information to people who are deaf through the use of an interpreter. Um, you also may uh, know people who are, maybe you vote by curbside voting when you go to vote. Again, that's an accommodation for folks with disabilities to ensure that we have uh, equal access to uh, public, uh, uh, public entity services. So any program or service that a public entity puts forth uh, has to be accessible to everybody, which you know, we all pay our taxes. Um, uh, Title III, again, with regard to store, with regard to those kinds of public accommodations, this is a similar scenario. Most of those accommodations are physical space accommodations. It might be things having to do with uh, physical access, but also things like service animals, which is a hot topic, um, service animals in stores and uh, places like that. Um, Title III does not apply to airlines, and so there's lots of controversy around access to um, flights and so on for folks with emotional support animals. Title III does not cover uh, airlines as a special carve out for airlines. So that's the broad scopes of the ADA, and I, I put all that out there just to say that the, the law was designed really to make sure that wherever somebody is in their relationship to disability in life, um, that the law is meant to uh, ensure that everybody has equal access. 
So with that in mind, um, I want to talk a little bit about what um, what the disability means in the context of the of the ADA and the and related statutes. Um, as I mentioned, the ADA was passed in 1990, uh, and the definition of was was set out in the statute, and it's that it's uh, a disability is um, a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. Uh, and then there's some other parts to it. I'm going to go over that slower this time. It's a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. Lots of parts of that definition that we'll talk about in a little bit more detail uh, in a moment. Um, it also includes, um, disability also includes when a person has a record of an impairment, um, in other words, a history of a disability, or that person is regarded as having an impairment. So a history of a disability um, uh, might be something like someone had cancer and they have recovered, but they have a history of cancer or maybe regarded as having a disability if, if they are misperceived as having a disability. And we'll talk a little bit about those um, um, in a moment. I do wanna contrast, um, and, I, and I know that Allison will hold me to uh, my definitions here. I do wanna contrast the definition of disability with regard to whether the ADA applies uh, as opposed to when somebody might be eligible for what we might call social security disability benefits. And so, the, the ADA definition of disability is much broader than what Social Security will look at in terms of disability. In the, um, in the broadest sense, Social Security disability, um, spoiler, I'm about to tell you everything I know about Social Security disability, which Social Security disability applies when, um, when you can't work anymore, essentially, that there are certain limitations or inabilities to um, perform the job you're performing or any other job. The ADA is much broader than that and does not require that the individual not be able to work. In fact, you'll see as we talk about the application of Title I having to do with employment in the ADA, the, the whole purpose of having that, uh, that section of the statute is because people, uh, many people with disabilities can work. Um, and there are, um, one of the things that we see in my work is that there's a trajectory or a, a spectrum, I suppose, that people in, at different points of their life may be able to work at some points and not at other points. And that might have to do with aging. Um, we all kind of uh, uh, develop different um, impairments over time. Um, it might have to do with disease progression. Um, and so that's the broad scale definition of, um, of disability under the ADA. Um, the question about <clears throat> what is substantially limiting. So the idea again under the ADA is that the disability, something's a disability if it's substantially limiting. Um, substantially limiting has a has a very specific definition under the ADA, which means that um, it's a an impairment might might uh, become be a disability if it substantially uh, limits the individual in um, the condition, manner, or duration in which they can perform a task. Which is a very um, cold way of saying it, but essentially, if a person is limited uh, or impaired in a way that most people are not. So, for example somebody with um, COPD, which limits your breathing, they may be able to climb a set of stairs or they may be able to do certain other physical things, but they may only be able to do that for a short period of time or it may have a you know, negative impact on their, on their um, uh, functioning if they carry that out as compared to most people in the population who would not have that limitation. So that's kind of how you might think about it is that it's not necessarily that somebody can't do something, but they may be, um, uh, they may, as compared to other people in the population, they may be substantially limited. Well, social, I'm sorry, go ahead, Allison. Say, social Security does use that standard too, so it's a good baseline. And as, to your point earlier, like someone, especially with HD, they could work for a long time, and then as their disease progresses, like they become more substantially limited. And so then it transitions from maybe being like ADA territory to Social Security disability territory. And that's why while these topics have a lot of there's a lot of intermingling between these two. They're different things, but the baseline between both of them is the same. It's like, if you are substantially limited, here are your options in different realms of the US government policies. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, uh, one, of the, one of the important pieces of decision-making really is when an individual decides uh, to pursue one versus the other, to pursue perhaps an accommodation under the ADA or social security benefits. And hopefully, you know, we'll talk about um, how to be accommodated in the workplace here in a little bit. Um, and so it's a very individual decision. And so having all the information you can have about what your options might be is going to be critically important. Um, one thing I will just add, and this is um, not specific to HD really, but, you know, as we're, as we're all living in the era of COVID-19, um, we, you know, one of the uh, limitations in terms of the application of 
the ADA is that uh, uh, an impairment is not considered a disability if it is what the statute calls um, transitory and minor, which means that it's real, a very short duration, so usually it's considered to be less than six months, and also it's, it doesn't really impair you that much. So the, uh, a common example is you break your thumb or something like that, it heals in two weeks. Um, it hurts, but it's not a disability because it's transitory, it's gonna, it's gonna go away quickly, and it doesn't, it's, not, it's relatively minor compared to um, other conditions. Um, the reason I bring it up in the context um, of COVID and also as we're exiting flu season is the, um, if something is a significant enough impairment as to the individual for uh, a period of time, it can be, even though it's transitory, in other words, even though it's going to end you know, in a set period of time, um, it may still be counted as a disability if it's not minor. So if you have real bad flu or if you um, uh, have some other impairment that is not uh, lengthy in time, but is, is debilitating for a period of time, then that can be, be considered a disability under the ADA. Um, <clears throat> in terms of what's covered, and I think this will this may or may not contrast with um, Allison's uh, discussion of, um, of what disabilities or what impairments are going to trigger um, coverage under the ADA. You know, the, I, I started to say earlier, and I never finished the thought, but the the statute was passed in 1990, and there were a lot of restrictive interpretations put on a statute by the courts over the next 15 or so years that really limited what types of major life activities could be considered, really restricted how significant someone's disability had to be before there was coverage under the ADA. And as a result of that, in 2008, Congress passed um, the um, Amendments Act for the Americans with Disabilities Act. So it's actually the ADA Amendments Act. So it's the ADAAA is what we call it. Um, it broadly expanded the definition of disability on the, the ADA. And the intent was really to restore the intent of Congress initially, which was to have broad um, coverage. And that's because, you know, in contrast to social security disability benefits, what you're talking about when you're talking about coverage of something under the ADA is not that somebody has an entitlement to benefits or something other than simply the right to equal access, the right not to be discriminated against, for example. Um, and so the broad coverage is meant to ensure the, the greatest participation by the most people um, in society. So um, ADA defined major life activities that would be covered to include things like you might expect from hearing and speaking and breathing and moving um, to things um, that also include a majorly bodily, major bodily functions. And I think this is an important um, point with regard, with, with regard to HD and other um, neurological and um, degenerative conditions, which is that um, you may have no outward showing of a disability, no, no outward manifestations of that disability, but if that disability, if that condition affects your um, neurological system, um, other systems include you know, immune system, um, uh, brain and respiratory systems, all those things that may be invisible to the outside and in fact may not be limiting you and how you move through the world at any given moment, so long as you're being impaired by that, um, uh, your, your major bodily functions are impaired by a particular condition, then that is considered um, a major life activity or major bodily function that will be covered. And another example that um, people sometimes use is somebody with epilepsy, for example, for the most part moves through life um, without really being impaired, but they have, you know, um, uh, an impairment of, of their neurological functioning that obviously has significant impacts at various times, um, depending on their seizure activity. Um, so that's the, in broad and broad and maybe too technical uh, sense of what is a disability. And for the most part, most things um, that we might think of as are disabilities, and maybe it's a little broader than most people might think. So I want to talk, talk briefly about going back to this question of a history of a disability um, or being regarded as. So if you remember the definition of disability. Um, is either you have a substantial impairment of a major life activity or major bodily function, or you have a history of such a condition or are regarded as. Where this can, can become an issue, and um, I think the regarded as may be um, uh, an important one for us to talk about. History, like I said, could be based on something like a condition that's been resolved, like a cancer that, is, that, that has been, uh, that's in remission. Um, um, but it also may be based, you know, when you're talking about somebody with um, a history of a condition, sometimes there's some bias built into a notion that maybe um, there, there's going to be some future limitation on their abilities or that they may be more costly to a company because of insurance coverage and things like that. 
Um, sometimes it's around things like workers' comp, a concern that somebody who has, for example, a history of back problems might um, be um, problematic from a workers' comp point of view. The law says you can't discriminate against people on that basis because people have to work, or you know, if, as long as they're able. But with regard to the regarded as piece, um, all that's required for coverage there is that an employer believes that um, somebody has an impairment, even if they don't. Um, and that's really meant to address some of the biases around um, uh, uh, ideas about uh, impairments and disabilities. And uh, it's where an, uh, an employer takes an adverse action based on that belief. And so we saw this come up um, more historically in things like HIV and so on. Um, but it really has to do with biases about what people might think. Um, and, you know, in the context of HD, um, it, maybe it would take a sophisticated employer to understand sort of the um, uh, the nature of it, but it might be that uh, there is a belief that because of uh, a family member, for example, um, has HD, that that the employee maybe is um, uh, also has HD, and so there may be some regarded as disability discrimination there, where in fact that's not the case. I do. Um, yeah. Yes, Allison. Oh, with HD, since it is a rare condition and it's not something employers may be aware of, and because the symptoms can be like it, they can slowly grow over time. What happens if the employer has no idea that you have HD and you just can't perform your job tasks anymore, but it doesn't seem like outside of like necessarily trigger that it could be a disability? Then what are the responsibilities of the employer in that instance? Right. That's a great question. And, you know, there's a big um, and what uh, topic I want to get into next is to talk about how about asking for a reasonable accommodation at work. But the threshold question there really is is disclosure. Right. And when to disclose. HD, and I know that this is a big topic. Um, in the context of an ADA issue, um, there is no obligation on the part of the employer to offer an accommodation unless, until and unless they know about the need for an accommodation. And so that means that there has to be some level of disclosure. Now, I know a lot of people are afraid that they're going to have to disclose a lot of medical information to their employer that they don't want to disclose. And in fact, the law does not require that folks give a great deal of information about their condition. Really what is needed for um, an accommodation is to provide some information to the employer that there's a diagnosis that requires or a disability that requires some accommodation and what that accommodation could look like. Um, and usually that takes the form of some sort of note from a medical provider that lays out some information about what the employer needs to know. What, the, what re often happens then is that the um, the employer will want some specific information about the ability to perform the essential functions of the job. Um, and so there's a little bit of a back and forth, but um, and I will point you to some materials that, may, that will be helpful in terms of what kinds of medical inquiries are, um, are permissible under the ADA. There's a certain amount, obviously an employer has a right to know that this is really a disability issue and have some proof of that in the form of medical information but there's a limitation to how far they can go in, in terms of prying into medical records and asking questions and so on. Um, so is an employer ever allowed to ask for your genetic testing? No, no. And there's a separate, um, there's a separate law that I did not touch on this presentation, happy to provide some materials on it, um, uh, that is specifically about genetic information and the protection of genetic information. So thank you for that question. Um, that, because that is not something that I had specifically covered, but that's an important thing for people to understand. Um, in, in terms of reasonable accommodations, uh, this is really kind of gets, I think, to the heart, into the heart of where the ADA comes into play in most people's employment life when they um, are living with any kind of disability. Um, and that is uh, the, the reasonable accommodation process and what the standards are. So again, as I said in the beginning, and this is why I kind of raised this question of what is the ADA for, what's the purpose? And the purpose is to remove barriers for people because there's just a general societal good for people to work as long as they feel that they are able to and want to. Um, and that uh, the ADA is meant to make that feasible. So the, uh, the regional accommodation process and the whole notion of regional accommodations um, starts from a premise, which is that there's a way that we We've always done it this way. This is how we do this job. A reasonable accommodation simply says, um, I, because of my disability, I need to do that job a different way. And I think it's a great time to be talking about this because in the, in the era of COVID-19, I never believed I would be working from home or that I was capable of it. And many employers didn't believe that it was a good idea to let people work from home, even though sometimes as an accommodation for a disability, um, it, it's, it's exactly what needs to happen. So I think, um, 
what we're learning now as a society is there's a different way to do things. And we're learning that that's okay. We can, we're all gonna get through it. Um, and so when we're talking about a reasonable accommodation, that's all we're talking about is asking the employer to let me do something a different way. Now that different way might be working from home, although that's not different anymore. Um, or that different way might be um, if I, you know, if I'm blind, I need to have a screen reader on my computer. Or if I have limited mobility, I need to make sure I have a clear path to my desk. You know, it could be any number of different things. Um, the statistic is that most accommodations in the workplace cost less than $100 to implement. So frequently it's no cost. It's usually a different way of going about the job that's already in place. Um, so the, the first question really is, is the person qualified to do the job as you're looking at a reasonable accommodation? Typically when you've got um, a situation like HD or some other job situation where the person's been doing the job, um, that's not that hard to, uh, to determine, right? The person is a, has a CPA and therefore is an accountant and can do that work. Um, the question then might become, what's the physical parameters around how they might be doing that work? And so the question of qualified to do the job it means you can do the job with or without a reasonable accommodation. So when you're deciding whether somebody can do the job, you have to take into account that they need, get an accom may need an accommodation. So you can't say, um, because you need a screen reader to do your job, uh, therefore you're not qualified because this job requires you to, to read a screen. Well, that's silly because what you're really looking at is what is the essence of the job? The essence of the job is to understand the material and to process that material in whatever way is applicable to the job. Not the, not the manner in which you are accessing that material. So that's the key distinction in the context of when can somebody um, use an accommodation to perform a job. Um, so getting back to, the, to Alice's question, yes, you have to ask for the accommodation um, and the employer may request documentation. And if, the, if for some reason the accommodation is what's called an undue hardship, the accommodation can be denied. It's a very rare thing for an accommodation to be an undue hardship. Um, that would have to be something that was an extreme cost or that basically caused the employer to fundamentally change the job. So the example that's an easy one to use is if you work on the factory line making widgets, you can't make widgets from home, right? And so working from home would not be a reasonable accommodation for making widgets, unless it is now, you know, times have changed. Uh, but that's, that's the standard example, something that requires you to be there. So if you wait tables, um, obviously that's something that you do in person. Um, and I'm using work from home as an example, probably too much, maybe for good reason now, but um, you get the idea. The idea is that if you can do the, the uh, if, if it takes you out of your ability to do the, the basic functions of the job, or if it's too costly. Um, when it, in terms of the cost, the issue um, is not simply does it cost anything because everything costs something. The question is, is it an undue hardship for this employer? And that is a very fact specific um, determination because if you, um, work for a large employer with a lot of resources, then an accommodation that costs $5,000 or something um, might not be an undue hardship. If you work for a, a small mom and pop shop and $5,000 was their profit margin last, last year, maybe it is an undue hardship. It's very fact specific. Uh, but again, most accommodations don't cost anything except a little bit of understanding. You know. um, so that's the gist of, of the accommodations process. There is, uh, and this will be referenced in the materials that you get, there is a, an excellent um, set of materials from an organization called Ask Jan. Um, actually, the website is askjan.org. Jan is not a person, it's the Job Accommodation Network. Um, but actually, you can pick up the phone, or your employer can pick up the phone and, and call Ask Jan, the Job Accommodation Network, and ask for specific recommendations about accommodations. But they also produce a lot of materials. They have HD specific materials about accommodating people with HD in the workplace. Um, again, that's gonna be part of the materials and a link will be in the materials to that. Um, but it has specific ideas for how HD can be uh, accommodated in the workplace. Um, so uh, in terms of um, reasonable accommodate, accommodations processes and um, guidelines, I've also uh, have provided some materials from Disability Rights North Carolina that talks about your rights as an employee and how you can assert your rights. Um, and so those materials will be available uh, with, um, with materials from this uh, presentation um, and also some additional materials on the disability rights website uh, around employment and also the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission um, has some materials uh, that, are, that are specific to the uh, complaint process. If you 
do you find that you are discriminated against in uh, employment? There is a complaint process through the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission um, that uh, has a 180-day time limit on it. And so just want to flag that for you. Um, it's an administrative process. Uh, it's not an adjudicative process. In other words, they don't, um, there's no judge and jury and that sort of thing. It's uh, an investigation that's conducted. Um, and then they attempt to resolve it if they can. If not, then they issue what's called a right to sue letter and you get a lawyer, et cetera. Hopefully that's never uh, relevant for anybody. We include it here just for reference. And again, the additional materials about that process are on the Disability Rights North Carolina website. Um, I, and I, Alice and I have not been timing myself, but I think I've got just a couple minutes left that I want to cover a couple topics, if that's okay. Yeah, you um, definitely have some time. Go ahead. Um, the the two, two things I want to mention quickly are there's also specific EEOC guidance around COVID-19. And I say that just for general uh, audience purposes that um, uh, whether uh, how COVID-19 plays out in the context of disability discrimination um, and other matters. Um, and then the other, the last piece that I wanted to um, uh, mention with, re with regard to COVID-19 is that there is an extension of the Family Medical Leave Act, which is sometimes applicable and sometimes folks need leave for a medical condition. And we really have not talked about FMLA at all. Uh, the Family Medical Leave Act can be applicable for short-term leave for serious health conditions and certainly um, applicable in the context of HDs and cons. Um, but there is an extension of that that relates to COVID-19 related um, conditions. The last point I would like to make that really is, is about the question of when do you decide to stop working uh, and when do you pursue Social Security um, is around the question of Medicaid. And, and many folks who work don't access Medicaid over the course of their lifetime. It's typically um, it's uh, generally for folks who are lower income. It's available to folks with disabilities. And I raise Medicaid at this point um, because although you can access Medicare once, you, once you've gone through the Social Security process, again, no, I know nothing about that, no questions on that topic, um, but Medicaid is also available for folks while they're still working if they have a disability. So if you have a disability as defined by Social Security, which Alice is going to tell us what that means, um, if you have a disability and you're continuing to work, but for whatever reason you need to access specific services or you don't have health insurance, you can access um, Medicaid um, as a person with a disability who's continuing to work. A lot of folks feel like um, that's a, a big barrier to continuing to work is losing um, benefits like Medicaid. Um, and I, I just want to flag for folks that that's, so that that's a benefit that is continues to be available. And again, there's some information and materials about accessing that benefit. And I'm hoping that that's a good segue to, to listen to Allison talk about this idea about when are you going to shift maybe from work to um, pursuing benefits. And I did have a few questions for you. First. Do you have an example of what would be like an ADA or an EEOC violation with an employer? Yeah, um, that, thanks. And, and that's a great question. And I, I want to give a couple of examples. You know, a, a clear ADA violation um, under Title I would be, um, you have a disability and I'm not going to hire you because of it, or I'm going to fire you because of it. So for example, I learned that you have HD and I decide that I don't want to have to um, employ you anymore and I'm going to fire you. That's clearly a violation because it was on the basis of disability. Um, another violation would be there's an accommodation that would enable you to keep working. So for example, um, uh, because of a uh, developing mobility impairment, now there's a need to work from home or a need to have one of the other accommodations we talked about in terms of the technology. Um, but, I, but even though it's going to cost me nothing or very little, that I'm gonna, then I'm going to discharge you for that. So those are the kinds of things. The other thing is that it's a violation to deny somebody a reasonable accommodation um, that, they've, that they've requested. So if it's a reasonable accommodation and the employer simply refuses, that in and of itself is a violation, even if you're continuing to be employed. Um, so thank you. That's sort of a basic question of like, um, what the ADA applies to both wrongful termination and denial of reasonable accommodations. And I, I, well, one thing I would add, if you don't mind, is it also applies to, uh, uh, in terms of retaliation. I, there's a lot of fear sometimes around asking for an accommodation because people are worried that they're going to be retaliated against. That's against the law. Um, and there's case law that says you can't fire somebody because they ask for an accommodation. Yeah, and that's a really good distinction because I know I've talked with a number of families over the years doing this and people definitely get hesitant to get an attorney involved. But if they're, I remember being in a hearing once and the disability judge turned to my client was like, you should have sued that attorney or you should have sued your employer for an EEOC violation. I'm like, 
a JJ plan. Um, but if, you're, if your employer really has done, like they have acted inappropriately, it's always good to at least ask an attorney because in a lot of circumstances, the attorney's not going to charge you just for the initial consultation. The attorney want new cases too. So there's no harm in asking a question and it's okay to ask. That's why we're here. Absolutely. And if you're in North Carolina, you can also call Disability Rights North Carolina. There's a similar organization in every state or territory. So if you're in Guam, there's a Disability Rights Guam you can call, um, FYI. Fun fact. I like that. Disability Rights Guam. Anyway, um, I did want to say one of the things that can, like, sometimes unreasonable accommodations don't seem as difficult, like, it doesn't seem like it would be an unreasonable accommodation, but based on... Um, all the social security hearings I've had, there are some things that are unreasonable accommodations. So for social security purposes, for work purposes, and I don't know if this applies to the ADA as well, but if you're gonna be off task more than 10% of the time, that becomes an unreasonable accommodation. Mm -hmm. If you're gonna be absent, like an unexcused absence from work more than one to two days per month, that becomes an unreasonable accommodation. Mm -hmm. Step one, that having to elevate your leg percent of the time and the employer providing something for you to elevate your legs on has become an unreasonable accommodation. That's yeah. interesting. Well, and I, and I, it's, it's interesting because, you know, the, the, the basic question is, can you perform the essential functions of the job? What's the core job that you're doing? Um, and none of those seem to me to interfere with your ability to do the core functions of the job. Um, so, uh, you know, I think that's really problematic. And one of the things about this question of when you, if you're being denied an accommodation, um, sometimes it'll happen and we see it, you know, not infrequently, someone's denied an accommodation and then they do apply for social security disability. And it becomes a little bit of a tension because when you're applying for social security disability, you're making certain statements about whether you're able to work or not. And so, and then in the context of your ADA issue, you're essentially saying, I could have worked if you had accommodated me, right? And so um, there is some case law that says you can do both things. You can make an argument that I would have been able to keep working had I been accommodated and still apply for social security. You just have to be clear that that's what's happening. Um, I had a thought and it went away. So my bad. Um, no, what, was the, what I was going to say is there's also this weird line. Um, so social security, like if you're an employer and let's say like, let's say my sister has Huntington's disease and I own my own business and I know she can't actually perform the job that I've given her, but I continue paying her a salary of $50,000 a year anyway, that is my right. And social security is like, if you want to play an employee who can't do anything for you, you are more than welcome to do that. Mm -hmm. You actually take that into consideration. So if you are getting paid to do a job you can't actually do, social security find you disabled even if you're making way over the income amount that doesn't happen very often um those people honestly i would say they're kind of in a positive circumstance because someone else is looking out for them and making sure they have income and they have insurance that doesn't happen very often but that is an interesting circumstance so if you're in a circumstance where you have a family member who's getting paid even though they can't perform the job definitely reach out to me yeah. um, but i'm gonna go ahead and get started into my presentation Great. The very first thing we're going to look at today is the Social Security Act. I have just defined what, what Social Security is looking for when they're looking in terms of disability. And I don't, you don't have to read the Social Security Act. You don't have to understand what they're saying. But the purpose of this slide is to emphasize that the Social Security disability process is written as law and must be followed as law. A disability application takes time, care, and consideration to complete correctly and effectively. If you do not follow the rules, you will get denied. That being said, the process does not have to be scary or intimidating. It is not impossible. You can definitely submit a successful disability application. And that's what I'm gonna talk about in my presentation today. So the first thing I wanna talk about is the social security disability benefits. There's actually two kinds of benefits and this triple up a lot. It's important to recognize that there's two different kinds of benefits because that dictates what benefit program you apply for. So the first program I'm gonna talk about is social security disability insurance or title. This is the work-based credit program, which means you have to be working at a job and paying into the social security system in order to earn credits to be eligible for this program. So if you've ever worked at a job that's paid into social security, you've paid into this program. And really you have to have worked for at least five of the last 10 years to be eligible for this program. I simplified that a lot because if you're under the age of 30, the rules are different. We don't need to go into that right now. Just for most people, you have to work five out of the last 10 years. There is no resource limit 
for SSDI, you can have a million dollars in the bank, you can get $60,000 a year in a pension, you could win the lottery, your someone could die and you can inherit a lot of money, it won't impact your ability to get SSDI as long as you have the work credits. Um, one nice thing about this benefit program is it does have payments to dependents, so you could get additional benefits for your children, your spouse, or your parent. So if you are supporting a parent with, when they receive more than half of your income, they could get benefits. If you have a child, a young child under, I don't know the exact age because Social Security doesn't publish everything, but I think it's like a child under the age of 10, your spouse could get benefits too because they're helping care for that child. If your children are older, like between the ages of 14 and 18, then your spouse likely won't get anything. It would all go to your children. And then the last thing is with SSDI, you would be automatically enrolled in Medicare after receiving 24 qualifying disability payments. For most people, it means it takes about two years to be automatically enrolled in Medicare, but that's not true for everyone. If it takes you three years to get approved for disability, your Medicare will start right away because those two years were already built into all that time you spent fighting the case. So the next benefit program is Supplemental Security Income, or Title 16. This benefit does not have any work credit criteria. It's based on financial need. And when I say financial need, it's like poverty level financial need. It's people who really, really need the extra assistance. Um, there is a resource limit for SSI. They're very strict. So you have to have less than $2,000 in resources as an individual or $3,000 in resources as a couple. Resources includes a checking account, a savings account, if you have a retirement account, if you have any money set aside for burial or funeral services up to like a certain amount can be counted. Like if you have, let's say you have like $30,000 set aside for burial or funeral expenses, they won't count all of it, but they'll count some of it. Um, they also look if you own more than one home or if you have more than one car, even if you're married, they hold it against you if you own more than one car. So unfortunately, they're very strict criteria. Um, they do not allow for payments to dependents and you are automatically, in most cases, enrolled in Medicaid if you are found disabled for SSI. Um, and this benefit is capped at a max of $771 per month. I did not say that for SSDI, but SSDI, I think the max benefit is around $2,900 per month. The national average is $1,234. So really this begs the question, when is the right time to stop working? And that question, like the answer is going to be different for everyone. So I just want everyone to recognize, especially with HD, because it looks different in everybody. When you ultimately decide to stop working or when you need to decide to stop working is a personal decision, but there's some things you should think about. Like, um, so I say there's some warning signs and because Lisa, Lisa and I have talked about in this presentation, there is a big difference between being unable to complete job tasks and being wrongly fired because of an HD diagnosis. Like if you just happen to trip and fall, like you trip and stumble into a kitchen cabinet at work one day, um, and you have happened to disclose your HD to your employer, but at that point you really hadn't been symptomatic and they start questioning things and they request a gene test, under no circumstances is that okay? You should never give them the gene test and at that point, it might be worthwhile to reach out to a disability rights organization in your state just so you know what your options are. Um, and one reason it's really important to know these distinctions, because a lot of people who have full-time employment have the option to get short-term and long-term disability as part of their benefits. If you get fired before you've input, like if you've started taking those benefits, you lose them completely. So that is one, and like that, it makes a decision hard only. You can decide if you want to disclose things to your employer. You know your employer best. Some would be accommodating. Some you're afraid of the consequences. Um, but if you know your employer is going to be accommodating, the more you tell them, the better prepared you'll be. So if you say, I need accommodations, and you can also start working with HR to be like, hey, I know at some point I might have to stop working. What do I need to do to make sure I get my short-term and long-term disability? And those are things to think about because the disability process is not a guarantee or the social security disability process is not a guarantee. It's not always easy and it can take years. I don't want anybody to have to go without income for years if it can be avoided. Mm -hmm. But some, like, so one thing to kind of think about is would you reasonably be expected to get fired based on your inability to perform the job task? Like if you're late to work every day, would you understand if you got fired? Or would it be reasonable to expect you get fired if you stopped being able to complete assignments on time? and you never disclose that you needed help. So kind of thinking about it like that. And some other warning signs are if you start having issues at work, like you're not able to perform your essential job tasks anymore. 
you have difficulty attending work and concentrating. So you have trouble getting to work on time. You're late at least three days a week or, you know, you used to be able to concentrate like a solid seven hours a day and maybe at most now you can concentrate for three. Mm -hmm. Or even if you have trouble interacting with your coworkers and supervisors, like that becomes a big issue. Like you used to be the most outgoing, friendly person and now you don't want to talk to anybody. You'll pick fights with your supervisors and coworkers. And like that actually can be a really important distinction. So if you can't work with people, most jobs require you to work with people. Social security definitely looks at that. Allison, do you, um, do you generally recommend that people start the short-term disability process and, and our long-term disability process at work at the same time that they're doing a social security application or do you do that sequentially? So, you can be on short-term or long-term disability while your um, social security disability application is pending. So I, I usually recommend, like it can take like a few weeks to really prepare your social security disability application because there's stuff that you really need to gather and you need to be prepared for the application. So in the meantime, while you're kind of working up to that, I highly recommend being on short-term or long-term disability if that's a possibility because then a safety measure and you're giving yourself time to get that stuff together because it can it's a, it's a lot of work and it can be really hard to have a full-time job and try to get everything together for your disability application at the same time um so some other things to kind of start thinking about as warning signs if you've been having trouble holding a job consistently so if you've been unable to keep any job for more than three months at a time or you've had multiple jobs in a 12-month period that could be a sign it's time to apply for disability because it shows you're not able to learn new job tasks and you're going to, and you've kept getting fired because you're unable to keep up with the demands of the jobs. Um, if you have not worked in over 12 months because of your HD diagnosis and your symptoms and limitations, you need to apply for disability immediately. And if you're making less than $5,500 a year, you need to apply for disability. And I say this amount um, because it's based on how many work credits you're earning. You can earn up to four work credits a year. If you're earning less than $5,500, it means you're not earning all four work credits, and it means you're slowly eating away at the amount of time you have left to submit a disability. I'm not going to go into too much detail about this, but everyone has something called a date last insured. If your date last insured is in the past, you're no longer eligible for disability, and there's pretty much no way to fix that unless you go back to work, and even then it's a complicated math equation. I don't know how to explain it. I don't know it. I just... I just, I just say it is what it is, just take it at face value. Mm. Um, so when you are finally ready to submit a disability application, the first thing you need to do is you need to familiarize yourself with Social Security's disability rules and regulations. And I say that like it's some easy task. It's, I understand it's not an easy task. I have spent a lot of time creating resources and my job exists so I can help families through this. But I want everyone to have a better understanding, just at least a basic level so they have some idea and expectation because if you just submit a disability application willy-nilly and hope for the best it usually doesn't end successfully or it could take you four years to get approved for disability and I don't want that either and so when you're starting you want to look at the application process so what is needed to be eligible for disability and what do you need to do to complete the application and what are you going to need to do once you submit your application and it's still pending so first, like we talked about work credits and your date last insured, you need to check to see if you're eligible, if you have work credits and you're eligible for SSDI. If you're not eligible for SSDI, then you need to see the financial criteria for SSI. Another thing you want to think about is your onset date. Every disability application asks you to allege, like to pick a date that your disability started. If you ask Social Security what date you should pick, they'll always say the date you stopped working. Wrong. Wrong. You need to have the date you stopped working plus the date you actually have medical evidence that supports your diagnosis and that you have symptoms and limitations of your diagnosis. Mm. There are a lot of, I've seen it many times. There are a lot of people with HD who stop working and then maybe they finally start getting medical care two years later. So if that's the case, you would actually need to pick the date that you started getting medical care. Because if you don't have any medical evidence of your condition, you're going to get denied. Which brings me to my next bullet point your medically determinable impairment. This is really just a fancy word or a fancy name for any medical diagnosis. And you should not submit an application if you do not have a medically determinable impairment because you will not be found disabled. Once you have a diagnosis, you should not submit an application, or sorry, once you have a diagnosis, it is good to check in with Social Security, their blue book, to see if that diagnosis is in the blue book, like 
like adult Huntington's disease, which is listing 11.17. And this is helpful because it can tell you everything Social Security is looking for when they're analyzing a, like a disability application. Um, and you said it was called Blue Book? Yeah, it's called the Blue Book. They're hopefully, not when this is live, but hopefully my PowerPoint presentation after the fact like the things that are in purple, those are actually links and you'll be able to click on those resources and they'll take you to relevant information later. You can also go to HDSA's disability webpage and I have created a number of resources where they have stuff there too. Um, but you can just type in Social Security's Blue Book and it'll take you to the website and then you can look through that. There's lots of different listings um, and information. And so it's just, it's a good place to look for stuff. It can be a little overwhelming, but it's just, if you wanna look through it and you understand it, Go for it. Have fun. <laughs> um, but like, it's definitely helpful because since Huntington's disease does have a listing, it spells out exactly what you need to know. And I will actually go over that a little bit. So you want to also be getting medical care. Having an HD diagnosis specifically is not enough because if you have Huntington's disease, you've had it since the day you were born. And what Social Security is interested in seeing is evidence that your symptoms and limitations have now started impacting you and your ability to work. So it's important, as I've bolded, to see your physicians on a regular basis and be open and honest with your doctors about your symptoms and limitations. Going to the doctor is great, but if you're not honest with them, then your medical records aren't gonna accurately reflect your, the severity of your condition, and you could also get denied, even if you're seeing your doctors regularly. If when they say, how are you doing today, you always say, fine, I'm great, nothing's wrong with me, that doesn't paint the picture you want to paint. I'm also guilty of that, so I know, but I'm just saying that as a warning. And then, um, you, another thing to think about is compassionate allowance. Huntington's disease, adult onset Huntington's disease is a compassionate allowance condition, and this is really important to recognize. So when you submit a disability application, HD should automatically be flagged, it should automatically get the compassionate allowance flag, we're talking about what should happen and what happens in, in the actual world. And a lot of times it does get flagged, but it doesn't always get flagged. So I always recommend to people that they actually request compassionate allowance in their application. Say, I should, I, because I have Huntington's disease, please process my claim as a compassionate allowance condition, just to make sure that that happens. And what compassionate allowance does is it supposed to expedite the processing of your claim so it doesn't take as long. So it always goes to the top of the pile. It doesn't necessarily go to the top of the top, like it doesn't have preference over other compassionate allowance conditions, but it has, it takes precedence over things like chronic pain or arthritis. Like there's a lot of conditions that social security gets applications for every day, but this one's supposed to be looked at more often and before a lot of other conditions. And so that can definitely help. Um, and then it's really important for you to understand your symptoms and limitations. And, that, like, and again, because having a positive diagnosis for HD isn't enough. The more detail you can give in your application, the better, because Social Security is making a decision about your disability based off your paper application and your medical records. They will likely never see you, so you need to be able to paint them a very detailed picture. The analogy I always like to give is would you rather submit the Mona Lisa or a stick figure drawing? <laughs> And usually that's the response I get. I get a laugh or like people, I'm like, are you going to answer my question? <laughs> answered because it almost seems like such a ridiculous question. Mm -hmm. And I understand, like if we're thinking about this in terms of the Mona Lisa and a stick figure, not everyone's going to actually be able to submit a disability application. That's the quality of the Mona Lisa. I would say that's like if me, like if you're a disability attorney and you've been doing this for a long time, you don't have to actually get to the Mona Lisa. But as long as you're way past stick figure, even that, like maybe it's a Monet, you've just thrown some color up there and maybe it's a leaf, maybe it's a flower, but you know, it's still a pretty picture. That's what we're going for. Just doing your best to make sure you're being as detailed as possible. And that's why it's also important to gather evidence because the more evidence you gather, that also helps you better understand the severity of your symptoms and limitations. And it helps you be able to talk about your condition, not just with social security, but with your doctors. So that information gets in your medical records that then goes to social security. This is like when someone tells a story about the time that my mom, sister's boyfriend, whatever, did something. It's all, it all relates and you need to make sure you have everybody. Mm -hmm. 
thing about that is when you gather evidence, you can get letters from friends and family. Because especially when you have something like HD, you may not recognize all of your symptoms and limitations because you live with it every day. Mm-hmm. And they don't always recommend getting help from somebody else, like just because it's such a difficult process. I would never want anybody to go through this alone and having someone else just to help you or be able to like have a different perspective can really add to the disability application. Allison, do you find, you know, one of the things we find in sort of when folks are trying to get accommodations at work or do other things with regard to disability that there's a lot of reluctance to be an advocate for yourself. Um, And can you talk about how that might play out in your work and what you've seen um, in application processes? You you definitely just asked a, a big whammy of a question. That is something I have seen all the time. And it is like, I know this is definitely an overwhelming process, but if the person you have to advocate for yourself most is yourself. And a lot of times, especially with HD, what I see is people don't want to be a burden to their friends or their families. So they're not honest with them. It's gotten to the point that they need help and they haven't asked for it because they don't want to be a burden. And so that also, like, if you're not being honest with the people you're closest to in your life, I've also seen that translate to you not being honest with your doctors. And because you just, you don't want to share that information. And the thing is, social security doesn't care. Like their job is not to figure out how to make you come out of your shell, how to make sure they get all the information they need. Because the way a disability application works, I know I'm making social security seem like a callous, terrible organization, but it's because the way the social security law is written, like we talked about earlier, is when, like if I'm submitting a disability application, it's my burden to show that I'm disabled. So because of the way the law is written, I have to show I'm disabled. It's not social security's job to show that I am disabled or I'm not disabled. They just have to read what I submit them and what I give them. And if I don't give them enough, then they can't find me disabled because I didn't give them enough. And that's one of the ways we're not advocating for yourself comes into play. And that's why I always recommend having someone help you, whether it's a friend or family member, if you get an attorney, because they're like, they can help you advocate for yourself because sometimes it's hard. So I, I, I have this conversation a lot where I have to tell people like, usually every day you want to just live in the positive, be like, I can do these things. This is what I did today. And that is not what you want for a social security disability application. You have to go to those dark places. You have to think, what are all the things I can't do anymore? What are the things that I've struggled with? And I, some of the worst days on my job were I made my clients cry because I had to ask the tough questions. But I knew if I didn't, we wouldn't get the information we need to find them disabled. And I know in all of those circumstances, all those clients were ultimately found disabled because I had to ask those questions. And sometimes it's too hard to do that yourself. And so that's why it can be helpful to have a friend or a family member. Like nobody, what is this? Like, I'm, so I'm thinking of like a lot of movie references right now. So my brain's working too fast. Um, but I think like the Princess Bride, what is it? The, the Dismal Swamp, where they go through the Dismal Swamp. Like Wesley and Buttercup needed to go through it together. Like they wouldn't have gotten through if they didn't like have each other. And the disability process is kind of like that. Like it can be really scary and intimidating and there's definitely rodents of unusual size. There's definitely rodents of unusual size, um, but you can, def- you can get through it. And so, and if you have trouble advocating for yourself, that's why people like Lisa and myself exist. So you can ask us those questions and we can help give you the tools. You're not alone. Like there's a lot of people and resources that exist. So you do not have to do this alone. And I want everyone to know that you are not alone in this process. Great, thanks. Um, so the next thing I'm talking about um, is so I have a slide up for suggested medical evidence for Huntington's disease. And this actually comes from Social Security's description of compassion and allowance for Huntington's disease. I got this directly from Social Security's website. And it includes, so the kind of medical evidence they're looking for um, They want to see records that document the progression of motor, cognitive, and psychiatric symptoms, which are all the things common to Huntington's disease. If you have a family history of HD, if you have an abnormal neurological exam or findings consistent with HD, so if you're going to see a neurologist who specializes in HD, those things should be in your medical records if you're symptomatic. They also take into consideration if you have the gene test, if you've had other brain imaging done like an MRI, um, and psychological and psychiatric reports, like the neuro, like neurocognitive testing. 
I like to say neurocognitive testing is like the holy grail of disability medical evidence. I also recognize that it's expensive and not every facility offers it. But if it's something that you have that's available to you and it's affordable, it can definitely help with a disability claim because it's one of those things, neurocognitive testing is pretty even across the board. Everyone has to do the same, like it's very similar. And so it's a lot easier for social security to compare and contrast. It's quantitative evidence, which is really easy for everyone to understand versus qualitative evidence. Um, but one thing that I really want people to focus on is the bolded section that says the diagnosis of HD or laboratory testing results alone do not meet the listing requirements. So if you decide to apply for disability just because you have a positive HD gene test, you're gonna get denied if you don't have anything else. And just, just so every, like I said this before, but there's no standard timeline for applying for disability. You must determine what works best for you. And as I'm about to talk about, you can continue working while your application is pending if you meet certain criteria and you could even keep working after you're found disabled. And the reason, um, before I tell you the reason why, just want to say that so the Social Security Disability process is a five step sequential evaluation and that's the same for both SSDI and SSI. It's the same for every diagnosis across the country. Everyone in the country has to go by the same five step sequential evaluation. And the sequential part is important um, because so everyone has to do steps one and two. Step three is the medical analysis. If you're found disabled at step three, they don't have to go on to step four or step five. You should be approved at step three. Everybody goes on their merry way. If you don't meet or equal a listing, then they go out, social security goes on to step four and step five. Um, social, so, and I'll go into more detail about that. But the fact that it's a sequential evaluation is important because that can dictate whether you get approved or denied at certain parts of the process. But as I was saying, the reason you can keep working if you apply for disability, um, because it's based on substantial gainful activity. So Social Security wants to see if a person is engaged in substantial gainful activity. So work does not have to be on a full-time basis to be substantial. Um, so substantial it means involves doing significant physical and or mental activities and gainful means it's usually done for profit. Well, substantial gainful activity in 2020 for a non-blind individual is $1,260 per month gross. So before taxes. So if you're working part time or if you're just making less than $1,260 per month gross, you can keep working while you apply for disability. And Social Security has set this amount because they have kind of determined that if you're making less than this, you can't actually support yourself. And so it's not just like you have a disability, but you also can't support yourself because your disability is preventing you from working at a greater level. So that's step one. Step two is does the person have a medically determinable impairment or a combination of impairments that is considered, considered severe? So severe means if an impairment significantly limits an individual individuals physical or mental abilities to do basic work activities so that sounds kind of similar to the ADA and then duration an impairment is expected to result in death have lasted at least 12 months or expected to last 12 months or longer um, and so this step shouldn't ever really be an issue for people with Huntington's disease because as we know at this time unfortunately it's a progressive genetic condition and there is no cure or way to stop progression at this time. So this stage of the process really shouldn't be an issue. That being said, it is possible to apply too early if you have Huntington's disease, because again, if you don't have symptoms and limitations, you're not gonna be found disabled. Again, just having Huntington's disease is not enough. So when you go on to step three, does the person's impairment or combination of impairments meet or medically equal the criteria of an impairment listing. So those are the blue book listings that we talked about earlier. And so Social Security describes for each major body system, impairments considered severe enough to prevent an individual from doing any gainful activity. And you can either meet a listing or equal a listing. So if you meet a listing, you have to have the specific test results, symptoms, or limitations specified in the corresponding listing. So to be found disabled per listing 11.17 for Huntington's disease, you have to meet all the criteria. And then to equal a listing, you have to argue that they're equally and severe to the listing. 
So if you have HD, you can't, it's really hard to equal the listing, and we'll talk about that because when you see the listing, it's pretty clear cut. Equaling a listing can come into play because there's a lot of conditions that don't actually have a listing. Um, narcolepsy is one of those conditions. And so Social Security ruled that in order to be found disabled for narcolepsy, you have to equal in severity of the listing for epilepsy or seizures. So there, if you go, do, if you do look at the blue book, Social Security has 14 different um, body systems that you could fall under. And then Huntington's disease falls under neurological disorders. And so to the listing for Huntington's disease mandates that a person must exhibit either disorganization of motor function in two extremities, resulting in an extreme limitation in the ability to stand up from a seated position, balance while standing or walking, or use the upper extremities. And so this can play out in a number of ways. It means you might have trouble walking, you stumble, or you're a fall risk now. Um, or I think for a lot more people, what happens is they start having issues in their hands and arms. Um, and so that means fine and gross motor movements. So like if you start having difficulty being able to tie your shoes or you're having trouble lifting and carrying or you start dropping items, those are all kinds of symptoms and limitations that Social Security wants to hear about. Or um, because not a lot of people with HD don't actually have the physical symptoms first, they have the cognitive or behavioral symptoms. But the second part of the listing is, or you have marked limitations in physical functioning in one of the following. Understanding, remembering, or applying information, interacting with others, concentrating, persisting, or maintaining pace, or adapting and managing oneself. I know I just said a lot of stuff, and those words probably don't really mean anything to you, and that's okay. Social Security does give further examples to define what those things mean. I also have created a resource that's on HDSA's disability page where all of that information is in one place. So it gives examples of what Social Security is looking for for marked limitation, understanding, remembering, or applying information, and what that looks like in a work setting. Social Security does not actually expect you to just know what that means. They do define it, and that information is in the Blue Book, or it's on my resource, which I took from the Blue Book. I don't make things things up. It's too complicated. So most individuals, like, unfortunately, the way Social Security works, because Huntington's disease is such a rare condition, I think a lot more people should be found disabled at step three, but they're not because the people who are examining the claims just don't see Huntington's disease very often. So when you're submitting a disability application, the more information you can actually include about HD itself, the better. What it is, what it looks like, um, it's really when you talk to Social Security in person, it's always good to say that it's kind of a combination of ALS, Parkinson's, and Alzheimer's all rolled into one because those diseases, like they trigger and understanding, and so you want people to understand. Um, so if you, for any reason, are not found disabled at step three, then Social Security goes on to step four. So does the person have the residual functional capacity to perform the requirements of his or her past work? And so that's work that you've done within the last 15 years. It must have been performed for substantial gainful activity. So if you worked somewhere for two weeks and it wasn't for SGA, they're not gonna look at that. Um, you also had to have performed it long enough to have learned the job tasks. And so different levels of jobs require a different level of training. Somebody who's an attorney would probably likely have to work somewhere for six months to a year to actually be considered for having accurately learned the job. But if you work in retail or a waitress, you don't have to have worked there as long. I and mean, this matters because when Social Security is looking at the different job skill levels, and we, so there's different skill levels. There's unskilled work, semi-skilled work, and skilled work. Um, and Social Security will look, so if you were somebody who did skilled work, they'll then look to see if you could do semi-skilled work or if you could do unskilled work. But if you were somebody who was only ever doing unskilled work, they would just look to see if you could do unskilled work. Social Security also looks at like the physical limitations, so they, like, they have different levels. So you could do very heavy work, heavy work, medium work, light work, or sedentary work. If you were someone who did medium work, you would have to prove that you could no longer do medium work, light work, or sedentary work. If you can't, if you just did sedentary work, like being an attorney, you would just have to show that you couldn't do any other sedentary work. But in that case, we would also have to show that we couldn't do skilled work, unskilled work, or semi-skilled work anymore. Um, and that, like, this is kind of where people get into trouble. Like, this is the tricky thing that's not really intuitive. 
but that's why it's really important to describe as many symptoms and limitations as possible because it may not seem like it's a big deal to you it may not seem or feel like it's really impacting your day-to-day -day life but it could be the difference between getting approved or denied for disability and we talked about it earlier but like if you're off task more than 10 percent of the work day that's enough but well how do you show that well one thing i like to ask people is can you watch a movie can you watch an hour-long tv show can you watch a half-hour tv show Yes. Well, are you actually paying attention and can you follow along for that entire period of time? If you can't pay attention for a 30 minute TV show anymore, how long are you actually paying attention on an individual job task at work? Like how much are you actually getting done during the day? So it's a different way to think about it, but it gets across the same idea. Um, and then if Social Security finds you can't do your past work, they go on to step five, which is, is a person able to do any other work considering his or her residual functional capacity, age, education, and work experience? So can you do any other work in the regional or national economy? And the reason I say that is because let's say you live in Virginia, but all of the jobs that you could do are in California, Social Security doesn't care. They still exist, so you would still, they would still find you that you're not disabled just because the jobs actually exist. And so Social Security takes into consideration both physical and mental um, limitations when they're looking at this. So physical is either exertional or non-exertional. So weight you can lift and carry, hours you can sit, stand, or walk in an eight-hour day. Non-exertional non things include balance, stoop, kneel, crouch, crawl, or climb, exposure to temperature extremes, fumes, chemicals, or dust, how often you could use your hands to write, or reach or handle objects, or type, or your ability to see see, hear, or speak. And again, so that's using your hands can be, a, it may not seem like a big deal. Like if you're having trouble tying your shoes, what else are you having trouble using your hands for? Can you not type as much anymore? Are you having trouble writing? Is your handwriting illegible? So it, it all relates back. And if you can kind of think about those in broader terms that can help a disability application. And then mental limitations include unscheduled breaks during the day. So in a traditional eight hour job, usually people get at least a half an hour for lunch and maybe one 15 minute break. Well, let's say now you have to take an additional three or four 15 minute breaks a day. That's becoming an unreasonable accommodation. Um, amount of time off task, days absent from work, or how, again, how you interact with supervisors, coworkers, and the public. Because, and that's important because a lot of times there are a lot of unskilled jobs that required you to be around other people like on the assembly line like you might have the physical ability to be on the assembly line but like being in close proximity just makes you angry and aggressive that would make it really hard for you to work on an assembly line so now we've gone through the five-step process what i'm going to talk about completing the application so before you even start the application you need to gather all of the necessary documents including medical records education records medication lists and your work history you don't want to have to be searching for things when you're in the middle of completing the application. You want to have all the information in front of you. You want to create a list of people with firsthand knowledge of your symptoms and the impact your condition has on your quality of life, whether that's a friend or a family member, um, maybe even a social worker. It's just it's good to have that list of people so you can know who you can turn to for help or ask questions. So once you have that, um, you want to you can file a person. Oh my God. You can file a disability application in three ways, in person, over the phone, or online. Um, and when you do this, you need to include all of your diagnoses and limitations. Let's say you're applying for disability because of your HD, but you also have depression and you have chronic back pain. Both of those things are relevant and you need to include those in your application because Social Security looks at your combination of impairments. So they look at everything you have. And so if you're supposed to include all of your impairments, you need to also include all of your treating physicians. So not just a neurologist, but maybe a psychiatrist, a therapist, a licensed clinical social worker. That's who you're seeing for your therapy. If you're going to occupational therapy or speech therapy, your primary care physician. Generally, I would say not your OBGYN, but in some cases that has been relevant. I talked to someone whose OBGYN knew enough about their family history and was like, you should go talk to a neurologist. So you never know which one of your doctors might actually have useful information. Um, and if possible, you want to list all of your relevant medical and educational tests in the application. And I know not everyone can remember every test they've ever had, but if you know you had your gene test and neuropsychiatric testing, you need to put those in the application specifically. 
You want to provide accurate and up-to-date contact information for your physicians so Social Security knows where to send medical record requests. Legally, Social Security has to send medical record requests, but there's no guarantee they get sent to the right place or they'll get records back. So do everything you can to help them out. Um, that means just taking a business card from your doctor's office or calling your doctor's office before you apply and asking what their best contact information is. Um, and then it's always beneficial to let your physicians know that you're applying for disability. And this is beneficial in two ways. One, some doctors update their medical records and what they put in the way they take notes because they know you're going to apply for disability. They start putting in more things related to your ability to work. Um, and so it's, that's really helpful in my practice and experience, because I've read a lot of medical records over the years, the doctors who did that because they knew their, client, their patients were gonna apply for disability, the approval rating for those clients was substantially higher than people who didn't tell their doctors anything. The other reason you wanna tell your doctors is because they could be on notice, they might get forms from Social Security to complete and send back. And you want them to send those things back. So once you've completed the application, the application process isn't actually over just because you've submitted the application. There's a lot of stuff that goes into it. So you're not, this isn't over just because you hit submit on the online application or you're leaving the social security office. You have to make sure you continue to get medical treatment and you do wanna contact social security if you have any appointments while your claim is pending so they can get all of the new information. You need to complete any and all forms social security sends you. And I can like, 97% guarantee you will get sent an additional form from Social Security. Whether it's something called an adult function report or a work history report, they like to send out those questionnaires because generally speaking, when they're getting medical records, those don't include information about the activities of your daily life. And these other forms do. So you wanna pay attention to deadlines and complete the forms in a timely manner. You wanna provide as much detail as possible, which can be hard because they don't always leave a lot of room on these forms you can add extra pages and submit additional information. I don't believe there's a such thing as sending too much information to Social Security. I faxed over 460 pages things today. I just send all of it. Um, and if you have questions, you can call Social Security and you should call Social Security. And then if sometimes Social Security will ask you to go to a consultative exam, which is a fancy name for a doctor's appointment. If they schedule you one of these exams, you have to go. If you don't go, you're pretty much guaranteeing your claim is going to get denied. The reason they're requesting you go to a consultative exam is they think you, there's not enough information in your case. So if you get requested to go, you have to go. Um, and a lot of times it's not, it's not a Social Security doctor. It's an independent physician that may be getting paid by Social Security, but they have specific rules and guidelines they have to abide by. And in my experience, a lot, especially if you're going for um, a psychiatric or mental evaluation, those exams tend to be very favorable, especially if you have Huntington's disease. I think physical exams are useless for everyone, but that's a personal opinion. You can't, for most people, you can't prove you have Huntington's disease by a physical exam. Social Security does have a weird rule, though. They have to have like evidence from one of your doctors in the last three months, and if they don't, they're going to send you to a physical exam, just so you have medical records from the last three months. I don't ask why for a lot of these things because I've just stopped trying. Um, but so while, um, and so traditionally, the application timeline. So once you submit an application, it usually takes about six months to get their decision. It should be a little faster with Huntington's disease, but the national average is six months. If you get denied, you have 60 days to submit an appeal, and for reconsideration, it takes three to four months to get a decision. If you get denied again, you have another 60 days to submit an appeal, and then it goes to an administrative law judge hearing. Currently, the national average just for a hearing is 18 to 24 months. That does not include the time it takes to get a decision after the hearing. That's about two to four months. Um, that being said, because Huntington's disease is a compassionate allowance condition, that's where I've seen it have the most impact at a hearing. Um, because it can make sure your hearing gets scheduled a lot faster, or maybe because it's Huntington's disease and you file your claim for compassionate allowance, the judge will actually look at your case on the record and make a decision without you ever having to go to hearing. And so of all of the stages, asking for compassionate allowance is essential at the hearing stage. Hopefully, we will have to get to the hearing stage anymore. So you have that information. Okay. 
So best practices when submitting a social security disability claim, do not undermine your solutions. Do not make it seem that you're better than you are because that's just doing you a disservice. Always ask for help if you need help. This is not something that should be completed alone. Ask questions if you have questions. This is not an easy process. This is not an easy process for me. The learning curve it took me to know all of this stuff. It took a long time. So I'm not expecting you to remember all of this. That's why you can ask for help. Work with your doctors and social workers throughout this process and keep them informed because they are your biggest advocates outside of yourself and your family. Um, track all of your doctor's appointments and contact information in our journal or a spreadsheet so you have it. It's also kind of good to track that information because you can track your symptoms and limitations. So when you go to your doctor's office and you go to your appointment, you have information to tell them because you've written it down. It's not always easy to remember everything off the top of your head, but if you write stuff down before you go, that can help make sure the relevant information gets to the right people. Um, keep an up-to-date list of your medications and why you take them. Social Security does ask if you have side effects from your medications, so you want to also keep in tabs on that because your side effects can be just as disabling as your condition itself. And so Social Security does take that into consideration. So if you have to take a medication because of your diagnosis, that's like the only thing that you can take for like progression of symptoms, but it gives you like severe debilitating migraines, but you might die without the medication, they take that into consideration. Um, and you also wanna make sure you follow up with Social Security regularly once you've submitted your application. You need to confirm your application has been received. You need to confirm when your application is sent from the field office to Disability Determination Services. That happens for everyone. Disability Determination Services is where they actually do the medical analysis of your case. They don't want you to know where they are. They don't want you to be able to access them. That's why it's not done at the field office. And then you need to confirm when Social Security gets your medical records, especially HD medical records, to make sure they have everything. The worst thing in the world is if you get a denial letter and they send you what information they looked at and none of your relevant HD records are included on the list because you didn't ever get a fair chance to get found disabled because they didn't get the relevant records. And you can call and ask that. And if you have the records yourself, you can submit them to Social Security and I highly recommend that. All of this being said, you're living in different times. And so I'm gonna give an update about Social Security and COVID-19. So Social Security is continuing to operate at this time, but they're operating at a reduced capacity and there are no person, no in-person operations. So you can only do things over the phone or online. They don't have all of the services over the phone or online to so be aware of that. Social Security is taking disability applications, but they're focusing their resources on cases involving terminal illnesses, compassionate allowance, or quick disability determinations. This fortunately does include adult onset Huntington's disease, but it is extremely important that you request compassionate allowance at this time to make sure your case gets correctly flagged. Social, like if you go to Social Security's official COVID-19 website, they say they are looking at other disability cases if time allows. So you wanna make sure if you submit a disability application, you refer to it as adult onset Huntington's disease and you ask for compassionate allowance. Um, the application process could take longer than six months at this time because they don't have a full staff. I think they're operating with only about a third of the staff. So you may definitely not get updates or responses from Social Security at this time. Um, but that does not mean they're not working on your case. They're just not wasting their time taking phone calls from people. And so that's really frustrating because sometimes you just want to talk to someone, but I think during all of this, you may not be able to do so. And that doesn't mean anything bad's happening, but it just means we're not going to get answers as quickly as we would like. Um, and if for any reason you do have a hearing pending, you need to contact your local hearing office if, uh, because all the hearing offices are operating differently. Some are doing all their hearings by phone, but some have postponed their hearings for months. So the only way to get an answer is to ask. Um, and Social Security does update their website regularly with COVID updates. And also, I just want everyone to be aware there have been a number of scams that have come out now because of COVID-19. Scams about getting your government benefit payment regarding the stimulus package that was just released, scams regarding Medicare paying for COVID-19 testing. So just be careful. And if you feel that like somebody has contacted you based on a scam, I recommend going to the Social Security website and they'll tell you the appropriate places to contact. And then if you have any other disability, Social Security disability questions, please do not hesitate to contact me.
Well, thank you, Allison. That was really informative. I learned a lot. Oh, I know, it was a lot of information. But thank you so much for joining me today. This was nice to get to do a presentation and I hope this was helpful for everyone. Thanks, thank you.